Well, have you guys ever done baking before? Yeah, have you ever done, ever done cooking? Ever had a disaster? Yeah, I can remember two particular disasters in my life. I wasn't the one that made them. I was the one that helped eat them and discovered they were disasters. Fortunately, it was my mum. Um, so my mum had two massive baking disasters. Well, one was baking, one was cooking. So the first one was a bacon and egg pie. Who likes bacon and egg pies? Yeah, they're pretty good, eh? Well, three out of four, that's not bad, 75%. Bacon and egg pies are pretty good. And so my mum went out and she bought pastry. And we were on a really tight budget, so we didn't have much money. And so mum was going to make this ginormous bacon and egg pie, and we were going to divide it up over a number of nights. Uh, it was very spectacular. We were all looking forward to it. I would have been about seven or eight, probably. And my mum made this massive pie, and we had been smelling it. You know, you smell it for ages. You know, oh, man, it smells so good. Can't wait for dinner. I'm going to munch back this bacon egg pie. But as time went on, it started to smell a bit funny. And it started to smell funnier and funnier. We're like, hmm, what's going on with this pie? And then we eventually get it up, and we eat it, and it was disgusting. Literally disgusting. Like, inedible. Now, there's not many things that me and my brothers and my father won't eat. But this was inedible, and it was because my mum had accidentally bought sweet pastry instead of savoury pastry. So we had a bacon and egg pie, which was basically crammed with sugar. And you may not realise this, but it turns out bacon and eggs and sugar don't go together. It was feral. We could not eat it. And so we had to throw the whole thing out. And then the second incident was when we bought a Bread machine, you know, the fancy bread machines, you chuck all the stuff in and a loaf comes out. We'd never had one in our life. We were so amped. We smelt fresh bread all day long. We were super excited for this loaf of glorious fresh bread. And eventually the timer goes and we're all excited. We run in there and my mum takes it out of the cooker and she puts it down. She cuts it up and it's still fresh. And we put butter on it. It melted and oozed into it. Like, yeah, we pick it up and we bite into it. But there was something wrong. It was, it was off. Something wasn't right. Something was wrong. And it, my mum had used a tablespoon measure for salt instead of a teaspoon measure. And it was nasty. It was nasty. And we had to throw it out. Eat once again, we couldn't eat it. We had to make everything new again. And, and sometimes in our lives, we have disasters and we have to try and make things new again. And, you know, this whole world is like that. This world's full of brokenness. It's full of sadness. It's full of problems. It's full of, you know, sore hearts and sore bodies. I've, I've been having sore knees for the last three days straight, and, and it's just kind of hard sometimes. But you know the wonderful thing when we look to the end of, the end of our story, at the end of life, when Jesus comes back, God promises that he's making everything new again. So just like we had to make a new bread loaf, God promises that he's going to come and make a new world and a new earth where there won't be brokenness anymore, where you'll never have to cry again, where you'll never have to have sore hearts or sore knees, but everything will work perfect. And that's, that's what we're going to be seeing in our passage today, that there is a glorious hope coming for us, that as our world tells us about all of the broken things we should be doing we're able to put our hope in a God who's going to make everything new again. Okay, let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for the fact that you're making things new again. And we pray that you'd help us to put our trust in Jesus who's doing that work, to hope in God who makes the promise. We pray for the children here and we ask that you would work in their hearts, that they might trust in you, that they might indeed believe that God is going to make them new again. We pray that you'd help us as a church to love them and care for them and fulfill all the promises that we made to them as you fulfill yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For those who are visitors, we are doing a special day of sermons today as we stand with the Canadian church who is now under the tyranny of conversion therapy laws. And they have asked churches from around the world to stand with them, to make a stand with them side by side as they prepare to potentially suffer for faithfulness to Christ. And so this morning we looked at a passage in 1 Corinthians and tonight we're looking at Revelation chapter 21. 
chapter 21. The sermon title will be misleading as I change the theme of the sermon, but with the same passage. Tonight we are considering hope, God's hope for a broken world. So Revelation chapter 21, we'll start at verse 1, but we're going to be considering 5 through 8 tonight. This is God's holy and infallible word. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God. And he will be my son. And as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Amen. And may God bless the reading of his word to us. Let's just come before him in a time of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you've left us with a witness to the truth. Lord, we completely acknowledge that we don't treasure it like we ought. We don't obey it as we should. We don't faithfully read it as would be for our good. And so we do pray that you'd forgive us. And yet now, as we turn to it this evening, we pray that we would listen well. We ask for your help by your Holy Spirit. We recognize that we're tired. It's the end of a day. The sun is warm and the sun is low. And yet we pray that throughout all these obstacles and everything else that might crowd into our mind, that you would overcome all of them. That you would woo us to yourself in your word that you would proclaim the goodness of Christ through me, your servant. Lord, we pray that as I speak to human ears, that you, Jesus Christ, would speak to all of our hearts and that we might hear from the living God and be comforted, that we might have a hope that lasts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, as we think about the state of the world, I thought a bit about it this morning, but as we think about the state of this world, the state of New Zealand, the state of the nations and the direction they're going, it's very easy to give in to despair, isn't it? It's very easy to look at it all and just kind of roll our eyes and say, it's just too hard. It's just hopeless. I mean, when we, when we think about the horrendous celebration of the murder of children, when we think about the killing of the weak and elderly, when we think about mutilation of bodies through transgender surgery, when we think about the drugging of children with hormone replacements, when we think about the destruction of marriages and the removal of of family values, when we think about the enslavement of minds through education systems seeking to promote godlessness, 
when we think about a prime minister who would jest that it's currently acceptable for 25 people to have an orgy together. It's just so easy for us to turn to despair. As the Apostle Paul says to dear Timothy, a time is coming where men will go from bad to worse. We kind of feel like we're in one of those bad to worse moments, aren't we? And in those moments, what we desperately need is hope. Hope. Not, not hope as the world gives it, but hope from God. Hope with an eternal perspective. And that's what I hope us to see tonight. I want to offer you God's hope for a very, very broken world. God's hope for a very, very broken world. You see, John knew what it was like to live in a broken world, didn't he? The Apostle John. I mean, you just think about the horrors of first century Rome. The butcheries and gladiators. I mean, people used to just leave their children out on walls to die in the sun. Pedo exposure. Paul knew what, the Apostle John knew what that was like. And, and he stood up and proclaimed God's word in the midst of it, and he suffered for it. Tertullian tells us that the Apostle John, the beloved Apostle, was boiled alive in oil before being sent to Patmos to be exiled there until he died. John knew what it was like to feel hopeless, I'm sure. He would have known that feeling better than any of us on the day of the death of Jesus, wouldn't he? Can you imagine pinning all of your hopes in this man and then watching him die? And all of your hopes being dashed? And yet John knew better than any of us the hopefulness of God who raised him on the third day, yeah? And when John went out to Patmos, to an island which has really nothing to see, in fact, I heard a story about this, where, which Sinclair Ferguson tells, where he says that one of his friends went to Israel to do a tour, and he said to the tour guide, can we go to Patmos Island? And the tour guide said, well, there's nothing to see there. To which his friend replied, tell that to the Apostle John. You know, it's, he goes to this barren wasteland and yet he sees things there that would fill him with a hope that nothing would thwart. He sees there an eternal perspective on everything that's happening around him. As Christians are dying, as Christians are being martyred, are being fed to lions and torn to shreds, being used as an emperor's lamp posts in his gardens as tortures. He finds a hope that is greater than all of these things, and I want us to see it tonight. Have a look at chapter 21, verse 5, the first half. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. As these visions come to a close and John looks towards the final moment, the final chapter of redemption, before we work out the rest of eternity with our Savior. God speaks. Now, this might not seem very significant to you, but actually, through the book of Revelation, there's only two times that I could pinpoint where God actually speaks directly to someone. It's always an angel or Jesus or a messenger or an elder or an angel or a cherubim or someone but there's only two places, right in the very beginning and then right here as well. This is a monumental moment for John. All of a sudden, from the throne comes the voice of God. And it booms forth directly to John and says to him, I am making things new. Notice the speaker of this hope. He uses that, that great phrase that Jesus used over and over and over again in the Gospel of John. Ego Amy, I am. 
You remember Jesus? I am the light of the world. I am the truth. I am the way. I am the good shepherd. I am. And now God says, I am. You see, this this hope that John is about to see, this hope that I want to offer you tonight, is not a hope based upon what you do. It's not a hope based upon a a minister. It's not a hope based upon a church. It's a hope based upon the eternal God. It's a hope based upon God himself. He says, I will do this. I and no other. And and what will he do? Well, notice the, the future reality of this hope. I I will make all things new. It's something I'm going to do. You see, John is, in a sense, looking into the future. He's seeing a vision of the day. The day when all things broken will be righted. And we see that in the previous verse, don't we? What, is, what, is, what do we see there? He, being God, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. See, he is looking into the future and seeing a hope where brokenness is removed. It's something we get to look forward to. It's something we get to hope in. But it's not just a future hope, brothers and sisters. This, this is a future present. What that means is it's a present participle, meaning it's something happening now, ongoing action, but it's used primarily to refer to the future. But there's no reason that doesn't mean it's something that's happening now. You see, as John is in the moment, he is able to look out around, he's able to look out around him at the church and see that God is making things new now. No, not in the same way that we will experience at the return of Christ. But is he not making things new in our midst? Can, can we not think, just think for the last two years, just the frustrations of everything. Yet we could probably all tell a story of how we have seen God move in the last two years. At a guesstimate, at a guesstimate, we've got what? In the morning, 70 extra people coming on a Sunday. I've heard of people being saved during lockdowns. I've heard of marriages being restored. In in the midst of the brokenness right now, God is making things new. And it happens in our own hearts, doesn't it? Just think about your own heart. What did we see this morning? You were these things, yet he has given you a new heart. He has caused you to be born again to a new hope. He has restored you. Think about the brokenness of your life. You know, we could think of family and friends whose marriages have almost been destroyed, and yet God has restored them. We can think of people who have Discovered hope in the midst of darkness. You see, it's tempting for us to constantly think about God's work as a future reality. But right now, God is is at work bringing about the newness as we head towards the day when it will be fully, fully revealed. Do you know what a blessed hope this is? As we think about the conversion therapy law. Do you have any idea? Do you have any idea how messed up people are left by the LGBTQTI agenda? I want to read you something. This is reasonably long. I want to read you something that I stumbled across when I did a talk for the youth of the church on biblical masculinity and femininity. I stumbled across this in a Reddit forum, which is a place for people to talk when they're struggling with transitioning from being a man to a woman or vice versa. And and this this is absolutely heartbreaking. So bear with me. I'm someone who has been wanting to transition for years and two years ago was able to start my MTF journey. 
I felt great on hormones and was eagerly awaiting surgery. Earlier this year, I was able to make it to Thailand for SRS and BA with Dr. Chet. I should have been more suspicious from the start as Chet moved up the surgery and waived the normal amount of time one needs to wait in Thailand after the surgery, counting the two-week quarantine time before the surgery in the one month. Anyway, I had doubts start to set in the night before surgery. This was the first time since I decided to transition that I felt any doubts towards any part of my journey. I fought so hard for this and figured it was just jitters related to surgery in general since I had never been able to I had never been put under for any reason before. But almost immediately after my surgery I started experiencing deep regret and it's only gotten worse as time goes on. I've pretty much withdrawn from public life outside of work. I miss my old self, and I'm not sure what to do. I've felt more suicidal than I ever have in the past, even though I'd never hurt myself because of what it would do to my friends. I'm scared. I don't understand why I went from no doubts to deep regrets so fast, and I don't know what my next step should be. I can't afford a reversal procedure. With the implants being so prominent, I can't just pretend that none of this happened and pretend to live my old life either. I do have one more procedure scheduled and paid for to help with passing, so I could cancel that and get some money back, but then I'm still stuck in this in-between state. Since it's only been a few months, and everyone I know has been so supportive of the transition, I feel like I stand... I stand to lose a lot by saying whoops and telling everyone I messed up. I tried broaching the topic with my therapist who approved me for surgery and she started distancing herself from me, likely to avoid admitting that she could have miss missed something. So I lost that support as well. Basically, I'm just looking for advice on what to do. I don't know why I'm feeling this way now at all times. But I miss my old life. I miss my ex-girlfriend and how life was before transition. I think at the end of the day, I was just a more feminine guy than a trans girl who had a childhood history of parental abuse that maybe led me down this path. It seems like, and hear this, it seems like most of the resources I've come across are religion-based. And I'm not religious, so that won't help. I don't know what to do next. Is that not heartbreaking? So I don't even know what... I don't even know how to describe the horror of that scene. Don't, don't you just want to sit down with this person and just say to them... God makes things new. There is a God in heaven who can help. There is someone who can help restore you, give you back what you so desperately need to tell you that you are cherished in his sight, that you are precious, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. But instead, instead, there's just a counselor who runs away and friends who support them. Oh, brothers and sisters, we have a glorious hope to take to these people. What if you or I could be the person to stand with that person and say to them, let me, let me show you something amazing. Let me show you someone amazing. Look, these, these people are going to be destroyed. Their lives are going to be destroyed. You no know, Suicide rates go through the roof because of this stuff. Someone's going to have to be there to pick up the pieces, brothers and sisters. Because the world's not going to do it. The world is not going to pick up the pieces at the end of the day. But the church of Christ can. 
we can be the one community that will welcome them when the rest of the world rejects them. Do you know what happens when transvestites get reversal surgery? They are rejected and outcasted by everyone. But not here. For God offers hope to these people. And he offers hope to you. Look, maybe, maybe none of us struggle with desires to be a different gender. But all of us struggle with the effects of sin, don't we? Maybe one of you sits here today and you, and you struggle with same-sex attraction. God says, I am making things new. Maybe you struggle with other sins. He says, I am making things new. This is not just for the world, brothers and sisters. It's for all of us. It's a God who takes away the brokenness and replaces it with something better. Because he replaces it with Christ. You see, this is the hope of the new. But notice also in our text that this is the hope of the true. Have a look at Verse 5 again, the second half. And he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Probably referring backwards. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. This is not just a hope for something new to come about, but it's a hope for something new that is sure, that is absolutely sure. It is resting upon a bedrock that can never be overthrown. You see, hope is hopeless if it's not sure, isn't it? You think about the world's hope, the way we commonly use hope in the world. Well, I really hope that happens. I hope I win the lotto this week. That would be great. I hope my kids come home for Christmas. I hope you have a good trip. That's not how it's used here, is it? This is a sure hope, a fixed hope, a certain hope, a true hope. N notice, because God says, it is done. It is done, or it has happened. You see, it's, it's as good as done. You know, when people say that to you, when you say to someone, Oh, we, we need to go pick up something from the shop. And they say, oh, well, consider it as good as done. What does that mean? It means you do not need to think about it anymore. You don't need to have any doubts. You can be completely sure that it will take place. That's exactly what God is saying. He's saying, I am making everything new progressively now and into the future. And there will be a day when everything will be finished and made new. And it's as good as already happened. It's as though, it's so sure, it's as though I have already done it. Because it's as sure as God himself. You notice what he says? He says, it's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You see, this, this surety of hope is not based upon us. It's based upon him. It says, I am the eternal God. I am the Lord of time. I created time. So if anyone is going to know whether there is a future hope, it is the one who is Lord of the future. Isn't it? It's the one who has written history and the future. Who knows where we will be in 8 million years from now, standing in glory with him. He knows the beginning from the end. He is the beginning from the end. It's as sure as the God who laughs. Don't you just love the God who laughs? Rob and I often talk about the God who laughs together. It's one of our favorite conversations. Psalm 2. Isn't it beautiful? The nations rage. Or the, the heathens, as it said in the old translations. The heathens rage. 
and the people's plot in vain. What does God do? He holds them in derision. He laughs. You see, we have a God who, who looks at all of this conversion therapy law. This is stunning. He, he looks at the conversion therapy law and the attacks on the church and, and the 200 people in India who were dragged out and beaten savagely this last week. He looks at all of the plotting, all of the planning, and he laughs. Because he knows what he's doing. Because while they think they're planning things, God is working out his plan. And so because of this, we have a hope worth sharing. You see, when we go to people, we share with them. We, we don't say to them, hey, look, if you believe in Jesus, you, you might be okay. If a transvestite or a homosexual or any other type of sinner comes to us in their brokenness, we don't say to them, look, God, God might make things better for you if you believe in him. No, we have a sure hope. We say God will. It's guaranteed. It may not be in this life. They may wrestle with those temptations. They may wrestle with those difficulties inside of their psychological well-being their whole life. Yet, there is a day we can promise them. I promise you, as sure as there is a God in heaven, that one day you will be made fully, completely, wholly well. You will be restored. Why is this? Well, you think about 2 Corinthians 1. You remember in that passage where Paul says, All the promises are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. And then it goes on to talk about the Father's work. And then it goes on to talk about the Holy Spirit's work. You see, the hope of God is buried in a Trinitarian God. Christ died for this hope. The Father gave his Son for this hope. The Holy Spirit seals us and carries forth the salvation for this hope for you and me. And so we have a hope worth offering. You see, our, our, our world around us keeps telling us, you know, the LGBTQI people just, they have issues. And if we just affirm them, they will be happy. If we just affirm them and allow them to do what they want to do, they're going to get better. They're not going to feel oppressed. You see, it's you people. It's you people. It's your fault that they feel this way. Now, the, the reason they are hopeless and like sheep without a shepherd is because they don't have a shepherd. Because they know not Christ. You see, this is a new, a hope of the new, a hope of the true, but it's also a hope for two. A hope for two. Have a look at chapter 21, verse 6 to 7. And he said to me, it is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. This hope is for two types of people. It's for the one who thirsts. Do you know how often thirst gets used? A desperate longing and desire for something. We talked about it this morning, didn't we? An insatiable appetite for something which cannot be satisfied in this world. You can think about Isaiah 55. Come, come, by water and wine without milk, sorry, without money, and I will give you to drink. Think of Jeremiah 2. Has anyone ever done anything like this? Exchanging the fountains of life for broken cisterns. You can think about Jesus in Matthew 11. Come to me, all who are weary and thirsty, and I will give you rest. Come to me who are thirsty, sorry, he says in John. Think about John with the Samaritan woman. Ah, oh, if you had only known. If you had only known, I would have given you water to drink that you never would have thirsted from again. 
It is the thirsty that, res- that receive this. Because they have a longing and a desire to have the hole in their heart filled. But lest you think that this is a work, lest you think that this is a work, notice that, G- that God says to John, they will, that I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. You do nothing to merit this, brothers and sisters. The world does nothing to earn this. It is given by grace alone, through faith alone, to a people that are hungry and thirsty and yet cannot find satisfaction in this world. Isn't that just the definition of the whole world? They thirst, but they fill it with the wrong things. But when people turn up here and in other churches and around the world and they thirst for Christ, God says, I will give it. As Augustine famously said, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in him. But it's also for conquerors. Conquerors. Turn with me for a second to Revelation chapter 2 and 3. This is a theme which is very important to the book of Revelation. Chapter 2 and 3, you get those, those section letters to the churches. Have a look at chapter 2 verse 7. Second half, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life. Verse 11, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Verse 17, to the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one accepts except the one who receives it. Verse 28, Oh, sorry, 26. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the ends, to him I will give authority over the nations. Verse 5 of chapter 3. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Down to verse 12, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. Verse 21, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. As I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You see, why conquering is conquering is absolutely essential to the book of Revelation, and it's absolutely essential to the gospel because it's not enough for us to just start. It's not enough for us to come in hope and say, "Hey, look, there's hope." No, the gospel calls us to remain steadfast, firm, immovable in our faith. Calvin, reflecting on this in, the, in his sermons to the Galatians, he says, Our Lord has given us the privilege of being taught in his school. We must no longer have weak faith, which can be blown here and there. We must have resolute determination. So that we can say, here is the faith by which we are going to live and die. However, if we waver, we will be just as little children. If they are offered an apple in one hand, sure enough, they will run to it. If they are offered some other pleasant thing in the other hand, they will reach for that in the same way. Having deserted the first thing, they will rally around the second. If I say we are as fickle as this, then it is a sure sign that we are completely unfaithful. See, God is calling us in this hope to remain firmly fixed in it, no matter the cost. And yet even this, even this steadfast trusting in the gospel is not our work. Because do you notice back in Revelation 21 that he says in 7, the one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God and he will be my people. Now the word for heritage there, is inheritance. Do you earn an inheritance? No, you just wait for your parents to die. Sounds a bit morbid, I know. You just got to wait for your parents to die and then you get your inheritance. 
This is why the Bible uses inheritance over and over again, because the son of God has died. And so we enter into the inheritance by faith. Now we're just waiting for it to be revealed at the final coming day. You know, let's be honest, brothers and sisters. It's very easy to have despair in days of abortion and euthanasia, gender transformation, and hormone therapies, and everything else in between. Yet God calls us tonight to look to eternity with John and with all the saints for the last 2,000 years who have read this passage and found hope. And we are to take that hope and offer it to the world. However, we should very, very briefly in closing recognize the warning. God says. Now notice this is what God says. Look, the, the world complains about Paul and complains about all sorts of things. But this is God. The same God who brings this hope speaking. And he says, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Brothers and sisters, hell is a reality. And this is not written here for us to play with. It is written here to warn us, lest we receive the wrath to come. Are you a coward today? Are you faithless today? Are you detestable today? Have you murdered people in your heart? Have you committed sexual immorality in your heart Have you toil, toyed with the occult? Have you worshipped other gods in your heart? Have you ever lied? Well, that's all of us, isn't it? And yet Jesus Christ, we are told, in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, Jesus Christ became sin. He who knew no sin became sin. A coward, became an adulterer, became faithless, became detestable, became murderer, became sexually immoral, became a sorcerer, became an idolater, became a liar, so that the righteousness of God might be given to you and I. You see, he became cursed so that you wouldn't have to. And that's why we have hope. And that's why we can go to all of these people in the world and say to them, there is a God in heaven who will accept you. Oh yeah, he will change you. But he will welcome you just as you are. And he will make something new out of you. Have hope, brothers and sisters. We have a gospel that is far greater than than conversion therapy laws. We have a gospel that is far greater than all the kingdoms of this world. We have a Lord, the Lord of the gospel, Jesus Christ, who is greater than everything this world could ever say. Put your hope in him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that we are not without hope. But we have a, a true hope and a hope for new things, a sure hope and a hope for those who are thirsty and those who conquer. We do pray that you'd help us to thirst for Christ and to conquer with Christ. We thank you, Christ, that you have paid the price so that we might enter. And we ask that you would help us to take this hope out into this world so that broken people might be restored. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.